Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from uh, myself, Al Bilowski, all the members of our radio station that make this possible, and from our show, Catholic Mysticism, where we talk about all things uh, dealing with our beautiful Catholic faith, especially the supernatural and uh, all the issues uh, sometimes that we have to deal with in our lives and in our faith walk. And I want to thank everyone um, that's responsible for putting the show on, and especially those, uh, Dr. Uh, Mahoud and all those at Holy Apostles. And I also want to thank you, our listeners, for making this possible and letting us come in to your lives and sharing your lives with us and your faith walk with us so that we can um, march through this battlefield uh, that all of us are in our lives as we continue to pilgrimage and walk toward our Lord, where one day, Lord willing, we will all be together. And again, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And you know, we're going to be coming to the close of a decade, of the 2000s. And what a decade it was. We have seen so much. We have seen the uh, terrorist attacks of September 11th. We've seen London bombings. We've seen the... uh, under the Patriot Act, so many things and so many freedoms, so many restrictions, uh, abuses by our government. We've seen uh, the Christians attacked and mass refugees exiting. And in a time where there are many, many, many martyrs right now for the Christian faith, we've seen the the debacle of a uh, Wall Street scandal and a housing bubble that burst and a great recession that caused many people to lose jobs, which was precluded by a spike in energy, which really hurt uh, not just uh, the country in the, here in the States, but all over the world. We've seen an election of a, our first african America president, and we've seen, again, you know, uh, Brexit, and that the people wanting uh, to get out of the European Union at the beginning of this uh, decade, we saw the fear of white uh, 2K and that the computers and everything would crash and people were convinced in hoarding things that this was the end. We've seen definitely politics and turmoil and a populist movement that elected uh, a president that was outside the normal two-party system. And then we see a more abuses of the government that seemed to take and try down this elected official. And we've seen in our church a pope step down, a new pope elected, controversies in the church, the ugly head of the abuse scandal, the sexual abuse scandal rearing its head once again, uh, financial scandals, and recent synods that have also caused a great deal of controversy. We've seen so much division not only in our nation, but in the world, in our families, where it doesn't seem that uh, unity and dialogue or anything have no place anymore. My way or the highway. And it's in all facets of life. Personally, in our families, we've some, seen some of our loved ones and our friends pass on to the other side. And we've seen new births. We've dealt with health issues and serious problems and maybe a loss of a job, and maybe a new start, and a new beginning, and maybe some heavy crosses in our lives that tested our faith, and maybe those who have converted that have found the joy of our Lord. So an incredible 10 years in the 2000s is coming to an end. And what do we make of all this? It's a very difficult time for some a very exciting time for other new technologies. We've seen that rise and the frightening things of advancements in cloning, implanting human cells into mice, artificial intelligence, and the fear of what that could bring. 
certainly on a military level. And many people unease, and the youth that now has what is referred to as the nuns, they have no religious affiliation whatsoever. We've seen a rise in the occult, in Satanism, in the demonic, in the rise of Wicca. And we've seen a youth that is very dissatisfied in many people, that they don't have a lot of hope, that they've kind of given up. And definitely a lot of changes in a short, really, when you look at it, period of 10 years. And we've had our ups and we've had our downs. We've had our victories, we've had our losses. But the key for us, the key for us is to not stay down. Boy, when we were on that mountaintop and things were just clicking, who wants to come down? But the reality of life is that we have to come down to the valley. You know, during the transfiguration of our Lord on Mount Tabor with Peter, John, and James, they were so entranced, so caught up in the spirit, they didn't want to come down. But the Lord knew they would have to. And what awaited them? They'd have to descend the mountain, the mountain of that spiritual high, and get into the valley of life. And he gave them that glimpse so they would hang on. And we know that he resurrected. And we have to hang on to that because we will come into that valley. We can't stay, whether it's spiritual or or on the mountaintop, with things going well in our lives. We have to come back to the valley spiritually and also in the reality of our daily lives. And we need to have that strong faith. Because we're going to talk today about a great hero. A strong, silent type of a hero. Not like, you know, the Gary Cooper in High Noon or so many of the Western figures that uh, we've loved uh, in the past. But we're going to talk about a true hero, St. Joseph. And we're also going to talk about, you know, we just celebrated uh, yesterday the Nativity of the Holy Family. And I'd like to begin with that. Because many people think that the Holy Family was just that, perfect and holy. And they were holy, but they struggled. You know, we have, through the resurrection, through the scriptures, through the church, all these 2,000 years later, we have the ability to see what happened. And the path for us then has been made easier by Christ and the church that he started. Because we know what happened. We know what happened with the birth of our Lord and what happened at Calvary and what happened on Resurrection Sunday and then Pentecost. So we know the path, in a way, has been laid out for us. But when we look at the Holy Family, what happened here? One, let's look at the birth of our Lord. Jesus could have been born in royalty, in palaces, with the announcement and trumpeting of the true king of the universe. And to be treated as such with that power that he has and that holiness and for all to do him homage when they see the power and the glory and yet Christ didn't use that avenue why he chose to be born as a little helpless infant to become one of us and the reason he did this is because people are not afraid of babies there's nothing really threatening about them for us to worry about 
why they are glorious in their birth and in their parents' eyes. They don't have the power. And they don't have glory where people give them homage. And they're not a threat. So we are not afraid. And they're accessible to us because we can let down our guard and be ourselves. And Jesus wanted this. He doesn't want us to fear him. He wants us to love and trust him and walk with him as a friend. To accept him with the trust of a little child. This is why he came as a baby. To make himself the God of the universe. The omnipotent. The most, po- the most powerful creator. And he wants us to not be afraid. So he chooses something, this child, so that we will come to him with love, surrender, and trust, and no fear. So he makes himself approachable. And he shows us through this birth and through his blessed mother, the Virgin Mary, and St. Joseph, that this is what I will choose. I will not choose to be born to a king and a queen in a palace with riches and wealth, my every desire to be met. No. I will lay down, and as St. Paul talks about, empty myself. Empty myself. And I will be humble. And my parents will. And we will have humility. And we will be poor. And we will struggle. You see, that's what I meant about the holy family. They were holy because both Mary and Joseph did not know how this was going to turn out. There was no game plan. There was no blueprint. But what made them holy, what made them holy is their unwavering faith and trust in God. That's what made them holy. Because they did not have a blueprint. And they did have some moments, as we do in our lives, of divine inspiration that showed them, yes, you're doing okay. You're on the right path. But there were many times they did not. And they had to walk with that faith alone. And they did so unwaveringly. And this is what made them holy. Because they struggled, as you and I. And they worried. And they did have fear. Because they were like us. They were human beings with the same problems of earning a living and and having to deal with nature and its elements and having to deal with other people in all our goodness and all our badness. And they continued to walk. And we know they were poor because when they went to bring Jesus after his birth to be consecrated, to follow the Jewish law at that time, that it was traditional in Jew, Jewish sacrifice to present, present a pigeon, a dove, and a lamb. And the Holy Family couldn't afford that lamb. So what they were, what was uh, given by the Jewish leaders was then for the poor, they would be able to purchase two pigeons and be able to make that sacrifice. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so they struggled. And they were able to afford those pigeons. And the lesson for us here, especially in this age we live in now, where some have argued this may be the most narcissistic society that's ever lived. And that says a lot. 
because human beings being what they are throughout our history uh, are quite selfish and that's all part of original sin and yet it's in the simplicity and the humbleness and humility that we live our lives that leads us to that holiness like the fa holy family did because we rely and have faith in God and trust in him that he has our best interests out and when we walk with this type of faith we realize that we don't need all the material goods and all the many things that we think we do that true wealth is to be open in our hearts to accept to learn accept and follow our Lord and that is where the true wealth lies the Blessed Mother and st. Joseph knew this and again this led them on the path to holiness with this humbleness and humility and that is what Jesus and the Holy Family show us and that is a that is an answer to the many many problems in our lives today um, you know we're going to talk about st. Joseph now and um, I want to say something about a feast that we just passed with the holy in innocence also but to go back we need to follow the simplicity of the Lord's life and how this whole process of uh, our salvation history began with a little helpless baby born to poor humble parents that had unwavering faith trust and grew in holiness in raising Jesus Christ and that is why we look at st. Joseph as this strong silent type of, of hero because there's not much in scripture that details about st. Joseph so in a way st. Joseph who is such a powerful patron think about how special this man had to be as was the Virgin Mary to be chosen by God the Father of all the people up to that time to watch over his son that he would give his creatures and he doesn't get a lot of credit we don't give a lot of thought to st. Joseph's miracles and apparitions and you know it, it seems we should much give him much more uh, reflection in much more honor as Catholics you know when st. Joseph look when we mentioned about growing in holiness you know think about what happened with the Annunciation now here Mary who's going to trust in the Lord to be his handmaid is going to be with child conceived but a miraculously by the Holy Spirit the Immaculate Conception preserved from sin and a quick note on that you know Mary was a creature like you and I and even though she was prevented uh, from having the stain of original sin through that immaculate conception she still needed a savior right because there's two types of saviors we can have let's say we're about to fall into a deep abyss a pit someone can warn us that we're about to step into it that's one type of savior and prevent us prevent us from falling into that pit into that abyss and that's like the Immaculate Conception she was prevented from having any thought or participating in sin because she was preserved from the stain of original sin she was preserved from God from falling into that pit the other type of Savior the ones that you and I need is that we fell into that pit we fell into that abyss and now we need to be pulled out we need that strong hand 
to lift us out of the, the abyss. And that's the Savior because we have in Jesus Christ, because we weren't preserved from original sin, but we're stained by it. So we need him as a Savior to pull us out of that pit of original sin. And yet Our Lady, again, did not know how this would turn out as well as St. Joseph, and she had to trust. And Joseph, we are told, in Scripture being a just man, when he saw this, didn't want Mary to pay certainly the supreme penalty of being stoned to death for committing adultery. Didn't want her to go through the gossiping and the scandal of being with a child outside of marriage. And he decided, I don't want to harm her. I love her. I am heartbroken. But for everyone's sake, I'm going to divorce her and do this quietly, as quietly as I possibly can to cause no harm to her. And what happens? Well, we're told that Jesus has a dream that explains what happened to Mary and the conception with the Holy Spirit. And to not be afraid to take Mary as his wife. Later, Joseph has another dream when Herod, he just had this in Scripture just a few days ago, livid that the wise men had tricked him, wanting to hold on to that power, decides he will through the time frame he was given by the Magi, he will kill every male that is two years and under. And Joseph is warned in a dream to flee and go to Egypt because there are those that want to kill Jesus. And then he is given a dream that Herod and those that wish to kill him are dead. Come back to the land of Israel. And he follows them. And yet when he gets to the land of Israel, he knows that Herod's son Archelaus is in power. And he fears for his son Jesus once again and has another dream to go to Nazareth. So what we see here Think about this. Joseph, all these concerns, and they are major. He's got the Son of God under his care. Is given divine intervention and trusts completely in that divine intervention from God and then acts on it. And there's a lesson in there for us. Now, I'm not saying we follow every dream we get and think that it's from God. And we willy-nilly just, you know, take this inspiration and go with it. We have prudence and discernment. We've talked about that on other, other shows. But the issue here is that Joseph, with this discernment, with this divine intervention, trusted and acted. And that's what we need to do. That's the type of trust that we should ask St. Joseph to pray for us. Because that took some guts. That's heroic. Because this was no undertaking. Think about it. If tomorrow you had to uproot where you live right now, let's say your wife is with child. You've got a stable job. Everything is going according to your plan. Your uh, stock portfolios, your retirement, your health care, everything. And you're told, that you've got to leave for the safety of your family, and you've got to go across to another state or multiple states or halfway across the United States and uproot everything. Leave your family, your friends, your job, your security. That took a lot of guts, but St. Joseph knew that this is what God the Father wanted of him to protect his son. So again, through Joseph, we see this unwavering faith of the Holy Family. That type of faith, that type of commitment, that type of oneness to God is incredibly heroic, much more so 
than any Western hero or any literary or movie uh, hero we can dream of. And St. Joseph has appeared in apparitions. We know this was part of the Fatima apparition, a major part with the miracle of the sun, where St. Joseph was holding the child Jesus and with Jesus blessed the world. And the world needed that blessing because the Bolshevik revolution was going to take place and there would be an enormous amount of carnage and destruction through the spread of communism, which Our Lady warned about at the apparition of Fatima. Now, in southeastern France, there's a town called Continac. And Our Lady had appeared to a woodcutter in that area. And St. Joseph, in an apparition, later appeared to a young shepherd there. And this shepherd became quite thirsty. Again, this isn't one of the highest, as it was back in Jesus' time, this wasn't one of the highest calling for human beings to tend sheep. It's tough, hot, and dirty work. And this young shepherd became thirsty. And he saw a kind old man. And this old man pointed to him where he could find water. And all he had to do was lift this enormous rock. And he trusted. And he did this to his astonishment. The old man told him, you know, my name is Joseph. And then he disappeared. And healings continued to occur at that stream of water that flowed from where the rock stood. You see, St. Joseph, again, a man of few words in Scripture, a strong, silent type. He assists us, the faithful, to this day in their needs in that town, as well as you and my lines. So that stream is still there, giving healings. Now, What's interesting about this apparition and miracle is that St. Joseph showed up in affirmation of a miracle brought about by previous novenas to the Blessed Mother. You see, the king and queen of France at that time had been unable to conceive. And nine months later, after the completion of that last novena, the queen gave birth to a child. And St. Louis, the 14th, had come to Contignac on that same day that St. Joseph appeared to the little the young shepherd. And you see, with God, we know there are no coincidences. Another famous miracle, and you may have heard of this one, and maybe not, there was a movie done about it, is the miraculous staircase in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that happened during the end of the 19th century. Now, the Sisters of Loretto had found themselves with a new chapel and a new choir loft. Just one small problem. It was 22 feet high to get to that loft. And there was no way. Apparently and unbelievably, the architect and the builder had overlooked that detail. And there must have been a reason for that because that seems, how do you do this? If you're a construction worker, build a car, how, how do you do that? That's a, that's a big miscue, big. But God works through mysterious ways. So the sisters contacted carpenters and the carpenters told them all there is no practical solution to this problem so they struck out here they have this beautiful choir law and this new chapel and the professionals are telling them sorry sisters but there's just no way we can do this there's no way we can get you up there so what did the sisters do they prayed a rosary novena 
and they specifically ask for the assistance of who? The patron saint of carpenters? You guessed it, St. Joseph. Now, you know that novenas are for nine days. And if you didn't, that's what we do. We pray a certain prayer over a period of time for nine days. Now, on the tenth day after the sister's rosary, a man showed up on a donkey with very simple tools. And he told him, no, I'm looking for work. Eight months later, he finished this structural work of art and left without ever identifying himself, and he never asked for payment. He created a complex spiral staircase. We think about only the basic tools, no glue, no nail guns, no nails, no hardware. He used wood that did not come from the local area to build it. And the sisters had no idea, no clue where he obtained it. And the sisters believed there was only one answer to this perplexing mystery. They believed the carpenter was, in fact, St. Joseph. And that spiral staircase, you can see it. I mentioned Fatima, the miracle of the sun. And how Sister Lucia had said that after Our Lady had disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament, we beheld St. Joseph with the child Jesus and Our Lady robed in white with a blue mantle beside the sun. St. Joseph and the child Jesus seemed to bless the world for they traced the sign of the cross with their hands. Now, let's think about that for a moment. St. Joseph appeared at Fatima with the child Jesus and Mary. He, with Jesus, blessed the people with the sign of the cross. Now, this is in connection, St. Joseph's apparition that Sister Lucia saw, coincided, connected to Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima. And we know that the miracle of the sun had taken place. And people from 32 square miles saw this miracle of the sun, as the people that witnessed it that day said, it danced in the sky. Danced in the sky. And St. Joseph was there. Our Lady was there. And baby Jesus was there. The Holy Family. And that's why it's important for us to try and emulate that unwavering faith. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. We have that faith and trust that they did. That's what's going to make us holy. Because one beautiful thing about our Lord, when we get down and out, and we don't, we, you know, I just talked to a young man last week that was getting a little frustrated. A lot of credit. Loves the Lord. He goes to confession. But he, he says, you know, it's the same sins. It's the same sins all the time. I, I don't even know where I go. And that's it's a trick of the devil. Gets you to think in despair, there's no hope. You can't get out of this particular sin or sins. So throw in a towel. Don't bother. But you see, the Lord knows our weakness. He wants you in that confessional. He'll give you that grace. It may take a while. It may, you may have to deal with this particular sin and problem until your last breath. But the key here, and the key for us, brothers and sisters, is when we feel we're not measuring up, when we get knocked down, when we feel that we have broken the Lord's heart and let him down, that he's still in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our faults and failings, gets glory out of it and asks us to persevere. And he will make this right. We still give him glory. We still, despite all that, help about bringing the uh, coming of the kingdom of God. It's incredible. That's right. 
in our weaknesses, in our sinful natures, in our selfishness, the times we turn away from God, the time we choose other idols, he still gets glory in our lives and uses us to advance the kingdom of God. And you know, you and I, whatever our particular mission is, whatever we're particularly doing to do that, that will never be repeated. Mother Mary, St. Joseph, what they did to bring about salvation history will not be repeated. Mother Angelica, St. John Paul the Great, St. Anthony, Mother Teresa, you and I, what we do to enhance the salvation history will never be repeated. That's incredible that God uses us. Think of it. He uses regular people, just like Mary, just like Joseph, just like the saints, just like you and I, to build this kingdom. He doesn't do it all by himself, by this divine wave of the wand, if you would, but by using people. It's an awesome. It's an awesome responsibility, but it's a great thing. It is such a great thing that he stoops to do that with us. It's incredible. And that's why don't get downhearted. Don't give up the ship. Go to confession. Even if it's a sentence, keep bugging. Keep growing. Keep getting that sanctifying grace. Realize that you're still giving God the glory. And you're in your weakness, in your sin, in your faults. You are still advancing the kingdom of God because you're trying. And the Lord is going to work with that. So have confidence, especially in these, this tumultuous decade we're leaving. And who knows? the future all there will be good there will be not so good but we keep that unwavering faith like the holy family all right back to saint joseph you know 50 years later excuse me um a that in 1956 and then again in 58 sister mary Ithman received messages from the apparition called Our Lady of America. And she also received a series of visits from St. Joseph. And he appeared on March 18th, March 19th, and March 30th in 1958. And Sister wrote that St. Joseph came again on March 30th. His requests were similar to those of Our Lady and the first Saturday devotion. The sacred hearts of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph have been chosen by the most holy trinity to bring peace to the world. Hence, the request for special love and honor. Also, in particular, for reparation and imitation. And again, as we begin the show, that's what we want to do. We want to try the best of our ability to imitate that humbleness and humility of the Holy Family and simplicity in our lives, and an unwavering faith and trust. St. Joseph told Sister that Jesus and Mary desire that we honor his most pure heart in a special way. And that way, given to her, was the first Wednesday of the month, excuse me, month, devotion. And in this devotion, he asked us to pray the joyful mysteries of the rosary and receive communion. And in return for one's doing, St. Joseph will be present at their death and lead them safely to Jesus and Mary. So, you know, St. Joseph also is a patron saint that we pray for a happy and a peaceful death. And that's very important for us. And if you're not doing that every day right now, I would strongly encourage, encourage you to pray that. You know, whatever prayer comes from your heart, to pray to St. Joseph to be with you at the hour of your death and to die a peaceful and a happy death. It's very important. And you can add it at the end of your rosary or whatever prayers you do. Just make it simple simple. But, you know, we see here in the 20th century that there's a pattern 
that of our Blessed Mother appearing, and then St. Joseph. Now, there's a miracle in Colorado with St. Joseph. And it happened to a cafe owner. And his name was Jose Arturo Maestas. And he gave thanks to St. Joseph for saving his business. You see, on June 26, 2019, St. Vane Creek became rain swollen. And this was in the town of Longmont. And it overflowed its banks. And the surging water, the surging flood water, they left high water marks on the exterior of his building that were almost three feet high. Now, the raging torrent in that town wrecked havoc on a business next to his, carrying merchandise off the cells and leaving, of course, a huge mess to clean up. But Mr. Maestas Cafe showed no signs of flooding in spite of all of this. And before locking up and leaving ahead of the approaching floodwaters, he placed the statue of St. Joseph on an inverted bowl in the entryway. As he did this, he promised St. Joseph to display his statue in a prominent place if he would save his business. And after the flood, St. Joseph's statue was right where he left it. Now, we know that people bury St. Joseph's statues to sell their property. Many positive results with that, but I want to share a personal story uh, with you uh, that I asked St. Joseph for intervention. Um, I had property in another state, a nice uh, vacation home, and uh, it was a, a beautiful home, um, much better than the one I live where I, in the state where I worked, and I had worked two jobs, tried to keep these places going. And um, during the crunch in the housing bubble, uh, it was very, very iffy if I would be able to do this. And basically, uh, I ended up having to sell the place because I had to, my livelihood was here and I was a young man and it just wasn't financially feasible to uh, work in a state that would pay me for the same work. Uh, absolutely nothing with no benefits, no pension, nothing. So that wasn't going to happen. But during that time frame, this particular state, it was up north, had a record cold in a 32-day period. And I mean cold, cold, like from zero to 24 below. And people's properties um, in this one area, the pipes were bursting, and their properties were being ruined. It was, it was a tremendous, uh, difficult time in this, this subdivision. And... Uh, I could not afford, you know, those people now were going to have things replaced. Some might have had their foundations. Done. It was a mess up there the, the following spring. But anyway, I had prayed because they knew this cold snap was coming and they were sending out letters and calling the people to warn them um, to take precautions if they could because no one knew how this would turn out. And I could never afford to have this kind of uh, um property repair if something uh, would go bad, even with the insurance. Anyway, I prayed to St. Joseph desperately. I said, St. Joseph, you know, you know, I'm just making it. I'm just making ends meet. I'm trying to hang on, and I need you to protect this property because I can't. I can't afford damage, especially anything major with pipes bursting or furnace or, or any of it. And, you know, I was sitting on pins and needles. And I got a call because I hired a guy. Uh, they were hiring people to check properties and do what they could to try and prevent it. And in this entire subdivision with all these homes, I had a call. And he said, Al, i got to tell you something. I've checked the houses. They've all got damaged. There's, it's a disaster. But when I opened the door to your property, I felt heat coming out. Your property is totally secure. And I was the only house in that entire area that did not have major damage. No question. No question. St. Joseph's intervention. Because that could not be. 
That could not be. And the Lord knew how desperate I was. So uh, it's a personal story of the intervention of St. Joseph, you know, and uh, my confirmation, my middle name, rather, is, is Joseph, and my Paris is St. Joseph. And it, it's just, you know, he, he needs more credit. You can pray to him. And, uh, you know, don't forget, he was the protector of the Holy Family. He's the patron saint of our church. And we need to give him his due, so to speak. And this is, he's a hero and should be treated as such. And, uh, you know, it's just an awesome, awesome gift that God gives us his foster father here on earth to be the patron saint and watch over the church. And, you know, a moment ago I mentioned about us trying to uh, not throw in the towel and not give up in our own particular lives when we fail, when we think we've let the Lord down. And that, on the flip side, don't give up on the church. You know, the church throughout our history, it's made up of men, and men and women, and it's, they're sinners. We're sinners. And yet, the church, despite all the things that it's gone through, is going through now, and will go through, still, like you and I can, give glory to God and work with our Lord to save souls in that tapestry that is salvation history. So remember that. Don't give up on the church either. Don't desert it. Just stay the course. Easier said than done for many people, but just stay the course. The course. Now, you know, when we talk about the Virgin Mary or St. Joseph or the saints, uh, especially for anyone listening to the show that is not Catholic, when we speak in high um, reverence, that's what we're doing. We are honoring those that have gone before us, that have led holy lives, that have led other souls to Christ, that have maybe like the martyrs given their lives for Christ. So we want to make the point, as Catholics, we never, this is a bad knock on Catholics, there's a lot of misunderstanding. We do not worship and give adoration to Mary or Joseph, St. Anthony, or all those. That is reserved for God alone. And we don't worship or pray to statues, images. We believe in what we call the communion of saints, where those that have fought this good fight, that have gone before us, are successfully now with God in the next. And we are tied together in this, as St. John tells us, this thin veil between our earthly reality and the more even real reality of heaven, just a thin veil between those two realms. So we ask the saints, we pray to the saints, and it takes the form of asking them to intercede, as you, if you were of a different faith, would ask your brothers and sisters that worship with you to intercede to God for your particular intention. And that's what we are doing with the saints. Because St. James tells us in the Gospel, right? Chapter 5, verse 16. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. Well then, who is more righteous than those already enjoying the eternal beatitude? And you know, the other thing I mentioned about statues, what do they serve as? Well, reminders. Like, our, say our grandparents or our parents or any of our loved ones, and we have a photo or two, even those in the present, what do they do? They remind us. They remind us of our loved ones, living and deceased. Similarly, we believe that statues and paintings of our Lord, the angels, the Blessed Virgin, St. Joseph, and all the saints, they help us 
and serve to remind us of our love for them and their love for us. So I, I just want um, those that don't understand, um, when we pray to the saints, we're not giving them worship and adoration as we do our Lord. And it's okay to ask the saints to intercede for us to him. You know, St. Paul tells us in Hebrews, right? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us. And that's what we want to do. And that's what we have as powerful, powerful, powerful witnesses. And St. Joseph, Mother Mary, and certainly Jesus Christ. So we say, St. Joseph, most strong, pray for us. And please, brothers and sisters, if you're not praying for that peaceful death and happy death, um, to pray for that too. Also, there's something called mystical fortitude. And I've mentioned before, and that might be something you also want to pray um, to St. Joseph for. Now, mystical fortitude. We have a particular judgment and the final judgment. Now, we talk about the final judgment, the end of time, when there will only be heaven and hell, no more purgatory, anything like that. That's, that's all she wrote. Will we be with Satan and the demons in hell forever or with God and the angels and saints forever? And at your particular judgment, if you are called by our Lord and pass over before the final judgment, there's something called mystical fortitude, and in God's mercy, you know, he will reveal your life, and you will see him, more important than the review of your life, you will see God for who he is, even if you've never acknowledged him. And he will still, in an act of mercy, at that moment, give you a shot to go with him in heaven or choose hell. And believe it or not, and pray for people on this, and pray that you have this gift of mystical fortitude, if that is your particular situation, to say yes when you see him. To say, yes, I will go with you, Lord. I never did anything. I never, I never did this, that. Take me with you. And pray that you do not decide after you've seen him who he is. To say, I can't. I can't. I'll go to hell. Because we know that Jesus doesn't send anyone to hell. You choose it. So pray for that gift of mystical fortitude. That if that is your particular judgment, that you have from the mercy of God that grace to say yes. That grace to say yes. Because I want to lead us now into the feast day we just celebrated a couple of days ago, those are the holy innocents. Now, uh, the holy innocents were those males two and under that were massacred because Herod could not take second place to any king. He wanted the power, and he wanted the power indefinitely. Christ was a threat, and that threat had to be removed because he would not bend the knee to anyone. And again, he was furious that the Magi had tricked him. And you know, the Magi were kings in their own right, and they did it right. They traveled, they walked by faith when that star was clouded, and they gave him homage and brought gifts. And they humbled themselves with humility. And the shepherds, when they were told where Christ was, they went immediately and sought him out in humbleness and humility, completely opposite of Herod. And sadly so, for many people that have power, they will not bow down. Pray for them. And so, in what seems so cruel, cool, especially with a loving father, how could these poor, innocent children be destroyed? 
and give glory to God, we are told in Scripture. Well, brothers and sisters, this is the nature of sin. And in many times, it's very hard for us to want to acknowledge what happens with sin. Because many sin, and see this with men in uh, pornography, that they don't feel they hurt anyone but themselves. My sin only affects me. And that's not true. Not true at all. Because sin not only affects the individual, it affects those socially. Because it's social. You see, because the holy innocence gave glory to God because they were just that, innocent. Because of the evil that Herod enacted in murdering those children, they were total victims, totally innocent. But they became, because of the nature of that sin, that lust for power, that pride, they paid the ultimate price. And yet they give glory to God, not because God wanted that. Remember, we have free will. Herod didn't have to do that. He could have been like the wise men and went with them and knelt down and bring gifts and pay him homage. But he didn't because of his free will. And just like the Magi had their free will, Herod had his. And he chose this path, this path that included the destruction of innocent people. How often do we see that? Because, again, sin is social. Because why? Because it is evil. And anything that is evil we see is from Satan. And what does Satan and that evil do? It opposes every aspect of God and his creation. That's what evil does. It opposes God. That's what Satan does. That's what Herod does. That's what people do when they commit atrocities. They oppose God. And let us be quite honest. All suffering, if we are honest and look at it, has that evil behind it. Whether it be starving children, whether it would be abortion, whether it would be murder, War, evil behind suffering. And so those holy innocents gave glory to God because of their innocence, because through their destruction, they are now enjoying eternity with God on a very, 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 very high level. And that is such a glorious, glorious, eternal life for them. And God used that for their soul so that they would be with him. And it is clear, the message is clear for you and I, that in our sufferings, that God will also do this for us. That we can, through our suffering, can gain merit in the eyes of God and glorify him in that suffering with that unwavering faith and trust. And because in many times we may be innocent of that particular sin and pay such a high cost, he will honor that. And that is so awesome and so glorious because we know how fast life goes here. It's a blink of an eye. But when we're on the other side, it will be no end. It's hard for us to fathom a time, but it's a true reality. And yes, it's horrible what they did. But compared to where those children are in heaven, looking at the beatific vision of God, joy and love and peace and happiness forever. 
That is a glorious, glorious life that God will honor through their suffering. So tonight, take heart in Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Pray. Pray to them for that humbleness, humility, and simplicity in life. And that unwavering faith and trust in God that they had so that we too, each and every moment of our lives, become holier and holier and give glory to God and in our lives in whatever way bring about the kingdom of Christ. Merry Christmas. Happy, blessed, holy new year. God bless, brothers and sisters. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.